Hi, I'm Dr. Yusuf. I'm presenting to you this case of uh, a traumatic dislocation of an uh, intraocular lens and capsule tension ring that was implanted in a patient with pseudoxfoliation syndrome in 2012. The pseudoxfoliation syndrome usually I don't implant uh, capsule tension rings, but in this case I did because it was a very advanced amount, and I'm glad I did because I'm using it now to suture the lens. The uh, so uh, the needle I'm using is the thin wall 30 gauge needle, which I prefer over the 27 gauge, as it makes it a smaller, uh, clearer pass, and uh, makes me not need to do a big flange for the uh, proline suture. Um, I entered two millimeters back from the limbus, and uh, the first pass is behind the capsule tension ring, so you direct the needle into the center of the cavity and then lift the, the uh, capsule tension ring up. You can see I'm using counter tra uh, counter pressure for, with a Lester hook from the other side uh, because the lens is very loose from the top. And then, uh, and you notice I'm not using any micro instruments inside so that you can use, use do this technique with just regular instruments you have. So this is the nice thin wall 30 gauge needle. And you can see I'm passing the, uh, the proline 5.0, uh, proline, into the hub of the needle and I'll tuck it in until it stops. It stops at an angle which I created about 10 millimeters from the uh, tip of the needle. I'm just uh, pulling back and pulling the proline suture with it, holding it uh, uh, with the needle holder. And then what we'll do, we'll create a small flange on the tip of that thing. Don't make it too big. Don't try to make it as flat as possible so it doesn't uh, irritate the patients later. Uh, then you track that, pull, pull it back in, and it stays in, make sure it stays in, because the path of the 30 gauge needle is smaller than the 27 gauge needle, as uh, the switch I prefer. Now I'm creating a little bit more space with the uh, endocote uh, between the lens, because the, the second path will be just behind the iris, between the iris and the uh, with the capsule tension ring and the lens uh, complex. So I'll go just in front of the first pass. So keep keeping some sclera between the two uh, two holes and going this this time, it, the direction is behind the pupil toward the center of the pupil and between the lens and the, uh, the, the iris. So once I see the tip of the needle in the pupil, then I'll, uh, I'll pa pass the other side. I frequently pre-place the proline suture so I don't need to manipulate while I have the needle inside, but this time I, I didn't, uh, but I prefer to pre-place it. So uh, now I'm getting the proline suture into the opening of the hub of the needle and pushing it through the the, uh, the, the core of the needle until it stops at the, at the bent area and just pull it out. While you're pulling it out, uh, the proline is thick, so it will make loops and can put, 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 put a lot of damage inside the eye. So be careful when you do that, manipulate the suture so it doesn't hit the cornea, it doesn't hit the iris and lens. So just do it gently uh, while doing that. Uh, you, I'm pushing one side and pulling the other side, so to just gently do that and center the lens in place. It's very important to, for these two uh, sutures to be passed at a a radial from the cornea. So both of them are one in front of the other. If you have a little bit of a displacement in one of them, it will produce a tilt and can tilt the, the uh, capsule tension ring and the, the intraocular lens. I cut it now and I'm planning to shorten it later. I uh, just left it so I have a little bit of leeway if I need to pull the lens a little bit forward, f f further when I'm doing the other side, but I plan to shorten it later. And now then I'm passing the other side, so the inferior part. It's also the, the mark is placed two millimeter behind the limbus. And I pre-placed the proline inside the anterior chamber through the paracentesis that's made 180 degrees away. So I'm making sure that the, this is 100, uh, 180 degrees exactly, because if you have any, any displacement, we'll have a tilt and displacement of the intraocular lens. So the first path is the same needle we've used before. 30 gauge thin wall and going into the cavity, uh, vitreous cavity, and then moving up a little, capturing the uh, capsule tension ring, 
And if you just have the lens, you have capture the haptic of the lens. The nice thing about having the capsule tensioning is that you can do it anywhere. Uh, while if you have just the haptics of the lens, you're limited by where the haptics are. So now the uh, hub, the opening of the needle, the bevel is in the pupil, and I'll just use the the needle holder to direct the proline suture into the bore of the needle and push it in until it stops at the hub or the bend, sorry, of the needle we created. You, you see here, I don't need any of the micro instruments. I had another patient that uh, I needed to do a little bit more manipulation. I might have needed the uh, the micro instruments for them. So I kept uh, I kept it for that and I don't need it for this McCabe technique. So now the uh, first edge of the uh, uh, end of the loop is out and I'll uh, just uh, create a flange there and uh, again don't make it too big otherwise it's going to rotate the needle uh, irritate the patient and will uh, make burying it uh, difficult so I'm passing the other half pre-placing it again and I'll uh, go in with the same needle 30 gauge thin wall just in front of the first pass. The first pass was two millimeter behind, so this is 1.6, 1.7 millimeter, just in front of it, and it has to be at, at the same radial as the other one. This time it's passing just behind the iris, in front of the capsule, uh, capsule tensioning and the lens, making sure that it's, you don't capture it again. There you go, so now it's in the pupil zone. I like to, to make most of manipulations in the pupil area at your pu pupil level. So uh, now I'm going to direct the other end of the proline suture into the bevel and push it in until it stops. Until it stops at the end. And I'm going to pull the proline while being careful not to create the loops that will push against the cornea the, pu the iris or the lens uh, capsule tension ring complex. So being very careful, put it in, just make sure it doesn't do that. And you can push and pull the two ends so that you tighten the lens pro uh, properly. You, we simultaneously do that. So, so pull one and push one, pull one, push one at the same time so that it doesn't pr produce a lot of tension inside and doesn't uh, pull in anything. Uh, so the uh, now it's uh, positioned well. I'm going to trim the extra suture. It, it, it's a very tight uh, uh, balance between having enough uh, tension and uh, not too much uh, suture underneath the conjunctiva. You can do multiple times to trim it, uh, which uh, you will see done on the other side too, the superior side. This is the inferior side. Uh, I trimmed it. I can't remember if I trimmed it twice or not, but uh, uh, you adjust it so it does, it's not too protruding, not too tight. And be careful because sometimes if you make it too short, you're not going to be able to create the flange and you will not be able to, you have to replace that suture. Okay, so I remove the flange, uh, so make it shorter. Every time you do that, you hold it with uh, McPherson and trim the, the flange and reapply the heat and we'll create another flange. So I kept the, some of the boring details because I wanted to show you the actual details, not the very, very clean video sometimes you see uh, and doesn't show you how to troubleshoot things. So I would like to see, show that part too. Uh, now the flange is okay. It's keeping in, uh, in place. And now I'm going to go back to the superior one, which I left long. Uh, I'm going to trim it again and again, actually, twice uh, to be able to make it... Uh, uh, Tight enough and not long, long, uh, too long to irritate the patient. If you can make it flat, uh, the flange is flat. Uh, t tip that lighter than dome tip that would be better because the patient would not feel it. It would be easily buried under the conjunctiva.
So uh, you know, pull it, cut the tip again. Okay, apply heat, create a new flange. Uh, be careful when you apply the heat because sometimes if a patient is, uh, of course, this 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 was under retrobulbar anesthesia, so probably doesn't feel his lids. But if you do it under topical, which is also possible, I prefer the under retrobulbar for these so they don't uh, bother the patient. Uh, they might feel the heat of the uh, the cautery on the lids when you come close to the lids. So the uh, now the. Um, the flange is created. You can see I created a little bit of sub uh, subconch heme uh, for manipulating, which you can have trying to bury this uh, flange because it has to be buried, uh, otherwise, it's going to cause a lot of irritation and uh, will be a risk of infection as, as it's a path to, to the inside of the eye. I had one patient that actually rubbed her, she disappeared after uh, one of these procedures a few years back, and uh, she rubbed it and she opened the, the flange. And she actually ended up with endophthalmitis caused by the infection going through that with the, with the suture. So, uh, and it's when I looked at her, it's, it's probably the, the, the flange was too big. I was too worried about uh, making it too small and it would split it inside. But uh, I found it's, uh, it was too big. Uh, so I replaced it, uh, shortened it, made it uh, shorter, uh, created a new flange that's smaller, buried it. I treated endophthalmitis with intra uh, vitreal injections of antibiotics and uh, she was okay. But uh, the take home message don't uh, let the flange be too big, otherwise, it's gonna pose some problems to the patients later. So now we're just doing bimetal irrigation aspiration. Uh, in this case, we didn't have vitreous, I didn't see any vitreous in it. But be careful with those. Sometimes it can, can be very tricky to find vitreous fibers that you didn't notice. If you're not 100% sure, just use Kinolog. Uh, just stain uh, whatever uh, into, uh, into your chamber and uh, make sure there's no vitreous, uh, because those cases frequently have some vitreous around the dislocated lens. You can see I'm sweeping the uh, the anterior chamber, making sure there's no fibers that are visible. I didn't use the analog because I have good visibility and I didn't have. Mm -hmm. So the irrigation aspiration is done and there's no vitreous in the anterior chamber. Now we're closing down all the wounds. I use the moxifloxacin diluted uh, to hydrate all the wounds. Uh, I don't use BSS. I hydrate them with uh, moxifloxacin, which is very very effective to prevent uh, endophthalmitis. Uh, so I'll hydrate the wounds with those and I'll inject the subconch dropless injection. So those patients, so I don't give them anything post-op except for lubricating drops. I inject uh, the dropless mix of triamcinolone, moxifloxacin and xylocaine uh, subconch. This, this is the hydration using the, uh, this, this is the 30 gauge cannula uh, and moxifloxacin. I usually use about one, one uh, ml of this diluted solution prepared by putting a, a full dropper of uh, of moxifloxacin in the dropper the drops over seven mls in a 10 cc syringe and use it for the day for the whole patients i'm actually what i'm doing here i'm, I'm lifting the conjunctiva up by passing the cannula through the opening of the the, uh, the flanges and uh, pushing some into uh, the uh, the moxifloxacin and subconch, and this is the injection of the droplets, uh, and went pretty well. Thank you for watching.